Hey guys, it's Amber L.B. Swenson. The theme for this year's Unbreakable is from Psalm 92 that says the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. We don't have any palm trees in Minnesota where I'm from, but I've always loved them. I love them in part because they stand so straight and tall, and it just feels like they're above everything else. So often in life, we've got storms and chaos and drama and craziness, and yet we can be like these palms that stand above it all. We don't have to get sucked into it all and be consumed with it. We can stand straight knowing that when we're rooted in Christ, we've got a solid foundation and He's gonna get us through whatever it is. And then I not only wanna stand nice and straight and tall, I also wanna be a refuge for other people so that they can come and experience that same joy and peace. So join us at Unbreakable, where we'll talk about this even more. We are continuing our series titled Last Call with an episode that I'm calling Blessings and Curses. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A, child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. This comes right from Malachi chapter 2, verse 2, which says, If you do not listen, if you do not set your heart on giving glory to my name, says the Lord of armies, then I will send the curse against you. I will curse your blessings. Now, I like to be in both the NIV Bible and the EHV study Bible. And this was one of the places where uh, the notes differed just slightly. So the note in the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible, said that this is really referring to God cursing the blessing that the the priests were giving the people, as in the Lord bless you and keep you. Um, A lot of us hear that blessing after the services, uh, at the end of the services, even today, our worship services. And basically the note was saying, look, the priests were serving God half-heartedly. They weren't even taking him seriously. So they certainly um, were not giving the blessing that God would have them give. Their, the blessing that they were giving meant nothing because they they weren't even fully committed to the Lord themselves. Okay, the EHV, the Evangelical Heritage Version of the Bible Uh, said that it was referring to the blessings and curses that you saw both in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 27 and 28. So I decided to go check out those two places to see what I could find about the blessings and curses that God gave and why. And so this is from Leviticus chapter 26, starting at verse 3. God said, If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commandments, I will send you rain in its season, and the ground will yield its crops and the trees of the field their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest, and the grape grape harvest will continue until planting, and you will eat all the food you want and live in safety in your land. I will grant peace in the land, and you will lie down, and no one will make you afraid. I will remove savage beasts from the land, and the sword will not pass through your country. You will pursue your enemies, and they will fall by the sword before you. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers, and I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you have to move it out to make room for the new. I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. It goes on from there. And then then, uh, starting in verse 14, it starts talking about the curses that will come from disobedience. And if you were to go to uh, the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 27 and 28, The curses are much the same. So what are the curses or the blessings that come from following God as God gave his Old Testament people? Well, first of all, he promised rain and then land that would produce 
crops. You will eat until you'll fu- you're full. When the new harvest comes in, you're going to have to move out some of the stuff that you were storing because you had so much last year that you don't have room to even fit this year's harvest in. There will be peace. There won't be war. You will pursue your enemies, but they will not pursue you. Now, I was just at a conference yesterday and I heard someone speak on Gideon. And so it was fresh in my mind as I was studying this and looking at this. And so I went to Judges chapter six. And sure enough, the first several verses show exactly, exactly what was happening, which God said would happen if you're not following me. So Judges chapter six starts like this. Again, the people of Israel committed evil in the eyes of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian for seven years. Midian and Amalek and the people of the east would go up against Israel. They would ruin all the crops, all the way to Gaza. So there was no source of livelihood left in Israel. What happened? The people of Israel turned away. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They started, all throughout the book of Judges, we're told that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. So God's law is here, but they really wanted to do life this way. They wanted the blessings of God. They wanted God's protection, but they didn't want to live according to his commands. I just got back a couple of days ago from uh, going out West to speak at a church it was super quick. It was a fly-in Thursday late night, just before midnight. Uh, speak on on Wednesday a couple of times and then fly out Thursday morning, bright and early. My, my plane left at 6.30 a.m. And when I got on the plane uh, on the way out on Tuesday night, I sat next to a woman. There was uh, one seat in between us, but she was very talkative and she told me what was going on in her life. And then Eventually, we got around to, what do you do? Oh, what do you do? Why are you going out here? And I told her I was going to speak at a church. And and she said, oh, I like my version of Jesus. I said, oh, what's, what's your version of Jesus? Well, my version of Jesus is okay with this. And he doesn't care if you do this. And he loves you even if you do this. And he hangs out with you, you know, like all the other You know, all throughout the New Testament, it talks about how Jesus was hanging out with sinners and and all that. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, it does say in the Gospels that Jesus did meet and and have meals with tax collectors and prostitutes and, but not to put a stamp of approval on their sin, but rather because he was showing them that he came to cover their sin and there was a better way. And they left changed, much as Zacchaeus. Once he met Jesus, he didn't want to be the same type of person anymore who would take more than what he was supposed to take for his own pockets. He was changed. He said, right here now, Lord, I'm going to pay back what I took. I'm not going to live that way. And and the people who didn't want to live Jesus' way, like the rich young man, he just left. So it wasn't that Jesus was putting his stamp of approval on every sin and saying, yeah, this is okay and this is okay. And go ahead, live that way. And so I told this woman that, and then she decided that it was very judgmental if, you know, people come down on other people for not believing the same thing. And I said, well, I would agree with you that we certainly always do best when we first and foremost uh, look at ourselves and our own sin and the things that we do wrong. And, and if we work on that, I said, we don't have a whole lot of time to point out what everybody else is doing either. Not much has changed since the book of Judges. We want to do things our own way, but we want the blessings of God. 
And I remember Pastor Mike talking about God's kingdom in one of his sermon series. And I think he had a, a Lego like big tower. And he was talking about when you're in God's kingdom, God gets to make the rules. You are submitting to his authority. You are saying, God, I am your people. I'm in your kingdom. So not my will, but your will be done. Much as, I mean, this is the way we live our life. As a citizen of the United States, I obey the laws of the United States. I live in Minnesota. I obey the laws of Minnesota. When I go to work, there are laws and rules and guidelines. There's things that I have to do. I can't not pay my taxes. I can't park anywhere I want. There are designated spots. These are handicapped spots. These are places that only certain people can park. We have rules everywhere we go. You go to a shopping center, there's rules. There's a speed limit sign for how much they, how uh, fast you can drive in their parking lot. There are places you can park. There are hours of operation. We don't just get to go to a store and say, you know, it doesn't work for me that you close at 10 p.m. I'll be there at 1030. We don't get to do that. That's not the way that it works. And the same is true with God's law. We are God's people. And so we don't get to say, well, I'm just going to do this or I'm just going to do that. That's, that's just not the way it goes. So then going on, some of the other blessings that God told his people in Leviticus chapter 26. He said, I will make you multiply. I will bless your offspring. I will place my dwelling in your midst and walk about you. I will be your God and you will be my people. That's what God wanted. Unfortunately, time after time after time, the people fell away. I found that early on having children. I remember when my kids were young and they used to ask me every Mother's Day, Mom, what do you want for Mother's Day? And I was silly enough to say the same thing year after year after year. I'd say, you know, if you guys just behave, it'll be a perfect Mother's Day. I don't even care if we go out to eat. I don't care about making food. We'll make this a good day for the grandmas. You guys just behave. And time after time after time, by noon, if not before, my kids were squabbling and fighting and yelling. And so, you know, finally, when they would ask, I would say, just tell daddy I want diamonds. And that will be good enough, guys. Uh, I was kidding. I usually got a gift card to a coffee place. But anyway, the Israelites fell away and we tend to do the same. We should know. I mean, even though we do fall away, isn't God good to bless us so abundantly? I, I was talking in church today after church with a couple of people and just saying how many prayers God has answered in the last just years. And we were all mentioning these people that I was talking to. We were all mentioning, look at how that prayer got answered. And remember when this was something that we were really praying for, or look at how God answered that prayer. And yesterday at the conference, I was talking with a woman that, uh, just a beautiful, beautiful woman. Her husband died of an illness. He had a very, very brief terminal illness within three or four months time he died and went to be with the Lord but she was saying that in her grief um, she's gone through different stages which is totally normal and beautiful but she's gotten this place of realizing that she had over 40 years with her husband and there would never be a time that she didn't want more She's that there there would there would never be a time that she'd say, okay, 50 years. Thank you, God, you can take him home now, or 52 years, or 58 years. She said she realized that there was never going to be a time that she wanted to live without him. So instead of grumbling or being sad that he wasn't around anymore, which she still is, because how can you live over 40 years with someone and not be sad? She's just thankful. For the 40 plus years that she's had with her husband. I thought that was a beautiful thing. You know, we can always find the things that we wish we had. There's always, you know, ways that we could tweak our lifestyle. Oh, I would eventually like to get 
a newer car or was hoping that blah, 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 whatever. You can look at all the things around you that scream at you from the world, like this will make you happier. This will make you look thinner. This will make your relationship better. Or have you tried this new technology? This will make your life easier. Have any of us noticed how easy life is now that we have technology? I say that tongue in cheek because when we were, when my family was in the Boundary Waters a couple months back, we noticed how wonderful it was to not have to look at our phones for a week. There were no emails to answer. There were no texts to answer. There was nothing that we had to just have, you know, always vying for our attention the way our phones are. In fact, as we were just canoeing into the exit point where we were getting out, there were outfitters along the shore where people would go and get their canoes and call them outfitters because they they sort of outfit you for your whole um, trip. And so people can just drive up to them and then they can get their canoes and their life jackets and they even have dried food that they'll send with you and blah, blah, blah. blah. And anyway, as we're going past an outfitter, clearly the outfitter had Wi-Fi because all of a sudden our phone started ding, 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 ding. <laughs> all these emails coming in and texts and it almost was like a weight a burden that descended upon us as we were getting to the end of our trip, realizing that the peace we had away from the world for the, for that week, it, it was coming to an end. And so we can always wish for more, want for more, feel like, oh, it would be nice if, you know, we didn't have this hip pain or wrist pain or this struggle or that struggle or if this relationship would work out or or what have you. Or we can look at how good God has been to us and see all the blessings that he's given us. Now, as far as if those blessings are coming as a result of us keeping God's command, not so. None of us could keep God's law perfectly. In Galatians 3.10, the Apostle Paul says this, All those who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Everything. If God said, you know, if you keep three of the Ten Commandments today, I will bless you. We might might maybe have a chance of getting through the day. Maybe, possibly not. (laughs) But anybody who doesn't keep everything written in the book of the law is cursed. End of story done, which means we can never, ever, 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 ever earn God's favor. If, If God blesses us, It's not because of anything we've done, because we break God's law continually. Now, I just want to break that down, because maybe you're saying right now, I don't get it, Amber. What are God's laws? How do you know what God's laws are? How are you so entirely sure that I am breaking God's laws? I think I'm pretty good. Okay, let's just go through the commandments. Is God number one in your life? Is he your first love? Is he the first thing you think about at the beginning of the day? Is he the one thing you're thinking about all day long? Is he the one you're worshiping and thinking about still when you go to sleep at the end of the day? I think most of us struggle with this. Our priorities, our time, our 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 checkbooks, they show where God falls into those. And if we're spending far more time, far far more energy, far more money on on things that have nothing to do with God's kingdom, then I think we all have to say, we're not so great at putting God number one. Second commandment, are we keeping God's name holy? What does that mean exactly? It means, A, just not taking God's name in vain, vain, not using God's name like a curse word or like an exclamation. Oh my God. But to keep his name pure and holy by using it to pray, praise, and give thanks. But it also means 
to not misrepresent him in the world. As we go into the world, are we showing people what it is to follow God? Not when we're weaving in and out of traffic. Not when we're impatient in the grocery store line. Not when we grumble if they ask us to move seats on our airplane. We're not representing Christ very well. Third commandment, are we keeping God's word holy? Do you look forward to going to church? Do you concentrate on the sermon and the hymns and the songs and the prayers while you're in church? Or are you just daydreaming because you're just checking a box? Are you opening up God's word and meditating on it? You know, Psalm 1, meditating on it, letting it sink into your heart, being like that tree that's planted by streams of water and letting God have his way with you, letting God's word get into your heart. Is that is that how you're living? Or would you have to say, you know, I do a pretty good job of that some days, but I'm not going to lie. Some days I keep putting more and more and more on the plate before God's word. And sometimes I never get around to opening God's word. Just a quick suggestion there. One of the things that I have had an insanely busy week, I spoke three times and in different states. And so tons of travel and just um, kind of trying to keep a whole lot of things going at the same time. And one of the things that has really helped me to continue to be in God's word, even when I'm not home, even when I'm on the road, whatever is that this week, instead of doing what I normally do, which as you know, I've said this so many times, if you've ever listened to me before, um, instead of doing where I'm reading God's word and writing notes and looking up words and, and following the notes in the study Bible and looking up commentaries, this week I primarily was in God's word by listening to it. So I have an app on my phone where I can um, punch in a, a book of the Bible or whatever, and it reads the Bible to me. And actually, I'm doing a 90 days through the New Testament right now, but I'm not even caring if I do one day at a time. I sometimes listen to five days at a time instead of one day at a time. But the point being that I knew that even while I was going to be gone and my schedule was going to be super, super abnormal, and that I wouldn't be able to keep up with my normal dig into the word the way I really want to dig into the word. It's not the same, but I was listening to it. And if you really struggle to get into the Bible, if this is something that's new to you and you're going, oh, Amber, I I don't even want to hear about this whole journaling thing. I don't have any commentaries. I don't have a study Bible. Really put God's word on, get a download the Bible app or um, that's not the app that I have, but I even know that there's a YouTube on YouTube. If you just type in the book of Matthew or the book of John, or there are different places where you can just push play and and someone will read the word of God to you. And I was just talking with someone this last week and they said, where do I start? What do I do? How do I do this? And I said, start in the New Testament. That's not the way I started when I first started reading the Bible. I started in Genesis. I I read to Revelation. I went back and went back and did the same thing. Genesis to Revelation, Genesis to Revelation. And each time you get a little bit more. But if this is brand, brand, brand new to you and you haven't been raised in the church, just start in the New Testament. It's a little easier to understand. Don't worry about all the genealogies. There's genealogies in Matthew and there's genealogies in Luke. Don't worry about those. Don't let all those names get you know, you confused or whatever, just skip them, move ahead. And this is what I told this person. You don't have to understand everything. Just keep listening because the Holy Spirit will help you understand and more and more and more of it will make sense. Just don't give up. Uh, Find a friend who, if you have questions, find a friend, let them explain it to you or just keep listening. And now We have so many websites now, of course, you have to be cautious because not every website is good. Not every website will tell you the truth about the word of God. But the, the fact is we have so many websites to help you. Moving on with our commandments, fourth commandment, just obeying authority, respecting authority. Hello, it's a political year. It's an election year. Do you respect your authority? Do you even, can you even say anything good? about the authority. 
If you can't, you're breaking the fourth commandment. Fifth commandment, do not kill. Sixth commandment, do not lust. Put marriage up on a high pedestal, or at least, you know, don't be so quick to get in and out of marriages. Don't be so quick to disrespect your husband. Seven, do not steal. Um, and I like to say with that, it's not just stealing as in things, but stealing people's time. Stealing God's, God's time, complaining about things. How many times do you go to pray at night and all you do is complain about the things that you've seen wrong during the day? This is God you're talking to. Praise him. Did you have breath in your lungs today? You have good reason to praise him. Did you have food to eat? You have good reason to praise him. Do you have anybody who you can call a friend? You have good reason to praise God. Do you know that you are forgiven? Praise God. Uh, Eighth commandment, are you building people up in your life or are you with your words cutting them down? Are you taking their words and actions in the kindest possible way? Because the vast majority of us are not. We are so quick to think, oh my goodness, why did she say that? Why would she say that to me? She wanted to hurt me. There's no (laughs) reason. We're just so quick to take people's words and actions in the worst possible way instead of the kindest possible way. And then don't envy. Don't be so quick to say, oh, why does God bless them, them with that? Look at what I have. Don't do that. Don't compare. If anything, compare how good God has been to you. I know things are hard, but but God is still with you and he's still answering your prayers. I was just talking yesterday uh, with another woman who is um, in a similar situation as I am with parents and and she was really struggling and and I said, oh man, I know. You know, and in a couple of years, this will all be behind us. And we just have to find the things, the, the ways that God is showing us that he's with us right now. That's how we get through this. God was faithful in the past. He will be faithful again. And, and he is here. Find the little things each day that you can say, ah, oh, God, what a blessing that you are here. I also, I really smoothed over the the do not kill um, without really mentioning that that's about hatred. If you have hatred in your heart, uh, the vast majority, praise God, will not kill somebody actually taking the life out of them in our lifetime, hopefully. But man, we can hate people and wish they were dead. And that's just as bad. So anyway, the point being, have we kept the commandments? No. Are we worthy of God's love and blessing? No. In fact, the whole reason that Jesus came to earth is to take the curse for us. Just a few verses down in Galatians, we're told Jesus became the curse. Um, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us on the cross. Jesus took the weight of all of our sins. He paid for them all because we never could. So where does that leave us now? We can't earn God's favor. We can't earn God's blessing. So how do we get it? We get it because God is a good father. And just as you, if you've ever had a child, you know that you love to bless your children, whether or not they're good. It's a whole lot easier when they're good. But even when they haven't been great, you still love to bless them. And that's how God is with us. After Jesus took the curse, now we are his people. And he loves to lavish us with gifts. We're told in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Why? So that we can have more blessing? So that we can be the people with abundance? That we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received 
mercy. I don't know if you noticed, but um, I like to put temporary tattoos on my wrist where I can read them. It started back when I was working at the nursing home. I bought temporary tattoos that were Bible passages, and I would put a different one on. They last not quite a week, about a week or so. And I was always giving baths, and so people would see the passage on my on my arm, and they would ask, oh, what's what's on your arm? And I would read it to them. And over the course of reading a passage all week long, I would try to learn it, memorize it, and put it in my heart. And today when I went to put one on, I'm, I'm done with all my speaking now, and I, I decided I was going to put one on again. I chose this one from Micah that says, though I fall, I will rise again. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. And that's such a good reminder. However the Lord wants to bless me these days, that's that's up to him. I think of the lives of the Apostle Paul and the, and the disciples. They certainly did not live lives of luxury. But oh, how they were blessed because they were God's people and God walked with them. And when God is our light, that is the biggest blessing. There's nothing else that can even compare. So whether the Lord wants to give me health or not, whether the Lord wants to give me abundance or not, whether the Lord wants to give me a long life or not, it's up to him. He's my light. And the only reason that I can stand up again every time I fall is because he helps me up. It's not because I've been so good. When I fall, typically it's because I did something wrong. I fell into sin. Once in a while, it's because someone pushed me over, tripped me. But just as often, it's my own stupidity, my own sinful nature that leads me stumbling in the other direction. And the only reason that I can rise time and time again is because my good shepherd comes over to me and he puts me back on my feet and he gives me a little nudge and says, that's why I came, Amber. I came to pay even for that. Now let's get to work so that you can declare my praises, so that you can get busy in my kingdom telling people about me so others know about me so others know that I'm here and I can set them free from all the things that they are going after it's a huge section about blessing and curses in the book of Malachi it's just one of the reasons that I have just so enjoyed studying this book and um, thinking about all that God has done for me and all he continues to do and why it is such an honor to be his child. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things.